Welcome to everyone who's participated on the call. We have a very exciting webinar uh, today. Thank you for uh, attending uh, another, yet another Philanthropy Roundtable hosted Zoom call uh, on, um, at, you know, on uh, best practices and high quality responses to this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, today, we are going to feature the work of an organization called Modern Classrooms uh, that has been at the forefront of administering professional development as well as distance learning uh, services, curricular resources, among other sources of feedback that teachers have been desiring during this pandemic. Uh, and to explain all that, we have uh, Kareem Farah, a founder and CEO of Modern Classrooms. Uh, he is a former DCPS educator, uh, where he first experimented and uh, administered the types of mastery-based and personalized learning uh, uh, resources that he uh, now really works full time uh, in, de in developing and delivering uh, in his work with Modern Classrooms. Uh, also on the call today will be Amy Valentine of Future of School, uh, formerly uh, the Foundation for Blended and Online Learning, and uh, it is a public charity devoted to uh, promoting uh, best practices in distance learning uh, and among uh, which include things like co coalition building as well as their innovative teacher prize. And I'm sure Amy will go into that, all that and more um, along with the partnership that they have forged with Modern Classrooms. Uh, so just to give uh, an outline or a preview of the call today, uh, Kareem and Amy both have uh, respective presentations that they'll run through uh, that'll last about a half hour or so and then we'll leave ample time for, for Q&A. We ask that you use the Q&A feature uh, to, ask, to type in those questions as opposed to chat. It just helps uh, my colleagues and I better collate the questions and we're able to get, get to them uh, more quickly. And you'll notice obviously we'll have PowerPoint presentations during, the, uh, during this call. Uh, those will be made available uh, you know, in, in our follow-up and uh, Kareem and Amy will be happy to answer any questions uh, and respond to donor questions uh, once we sign off here in case uh, in case you want to follow up with, with either of them. And so with that being said, um, the roundtable also has general uh, COVID-19 resources on our website. I encourage you to look at those uh, and ask any questions. And then also uh, we're constantly seeking feedback on these Zoom calls, uh, both you know the ones we've hosted previously as well as looking ahead to the future. So any feedback you may have for us uh, on that uh, would be greatly valuable. Um, so with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Kareem. Thanks, Pat, and thank you for everyone joining. Incredibly excited to be able to share the work of the Modern Classrooms Project and how we're working to kind of solve the challenges of distance learning uh, and really think about how we can support with personalized learning and blended learning across the country. I'm gonna go ahead and screen share now so you'll see a slide deck pop up momentarily. And I'm just gonna spend about 20 minutes kind of running through the Modern Classrooms Project as an organization. Uh, tell us a little bit about who we are and the problem that we try to solve, and then in particular focus on our response to COVID-19 and how we're trying to scale um, our work. So to get started, just a little bit about who we are. We, of course, are a nonprofit. Um, we are just over two years old, so we're a young nonprofit. And our, our goal is to basically equip and empower educators to implement our instructional model, which is a blended self-paced mastery-based instructional model. Now, we were founded by myself and my co-founder, and we're two award-winning educators. The model really kind of took off when I won the award for DC's Most Innovative Educator, for having built this model in the classroom. And then since then, we've been devoted to really thinking about how we can support teachers to delicately leverage technology in the classroom and provide them with an actual instructional model that they can implement day in and day out. So I wanna talk briefly about the problem we address because I think it's easy during COVID-19 to focus on COVID-19 challenges, which are incredibly important, I'll certainly be addressing. But before then, I wanna talk a little bit about the problem that we were addressing initially prior to when COVID-19 hit. And it's really two parts, academic proficiency and absenteeism. We know nationally, especially in inner city public schools, academic proficiency is a huge struggle. Currently 27% uh, of eighth graders are proficient in English and in math at the inner city level in, in math and reading. And absenteeism is a huge challenge, especially for teachers to deal with. We have 21% right now of students that are chronically absent across the country. Now, it's easy to kind of look at these problems and say, okay, that's a big issue, How? what next? And it's often kind of lost on folks what this actually looks like when you then translate that data into teaching a classroom and trying to imagine what it's like to teach traditionally given that data. And what ends up happening, and I certainly experienced this myself, 
is you stand in front of a classroom and your group of 25 students is broken up into groups and those groups are actually uniquely negatively impacted by a traditional model. So if you imagine standing in front of a classroom of 25 knowing that data, only about five students are actually going to be on grade level and present. And the challenge with these students is they usually think the content is too boring or too easy. You're stuck teaching to the middle, which is a huge struggle. And it's really frustrating as an educator, and I certainly experienced this myself after six years in the classroom, that you're teaching to the middle and these kids can't be pushed. And it's kind of heartbreaking to know that the kids that are there ready to learn on grade level aren't actually being inspired by what you're putting in front of them. Then you have a whole other group of students. These students are absent. They're often absent due to traumatic reasons, but when they return back to the class environment, we haven't created a space for them to return. Instead, they're supposed to pick up where they left off. There aren't necessarily resources available for them to do that. And basically, we start to kind of cultivate chronic absenteeism because kids who are absent get more and more frustrated the more they return to class and aren't able to access content. And then you have your below proficient students. And this group of students is often classified as being behaviorally a struggle. They can be disruptive at times, but the truth of the matter is they've been walking into classrooms that haven't actually met their needs for years. And they're stuck kind of sitting in front of a classroom, experiencing a traditional model of teaching, not figuring out how they can access it, feeling unsuccessful, and over time getting frustrated. And the end result is the educator actually starts to feel like a failure. And I felt this way because the first three years I taught, I taught traditionally, and I knew something wasn't right. I never felt like I was actually cultivating mastery, but I was told to just kind of push those problems away because that's what it's like to teach in a low-income community. But I was frustrated by that reality and I wasn't going to kind of settle for that. So instead, I decided with my co-founder to innovate and think of a new way to actually reach students. So our solution to this problem of kind of rampant traditional style forms of teaching is to actually train teachers on a clear instructional model. And through our personalized training programs, we teach teachers how to run a blended self-paced mastery-based approach to teaching. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what this actual model looks like because some of these terms may be familiar and you may have seen them in other places, but we have a very specific way that they kind of tie together and a specific way that we train teachers on this model. So the first part is the blended instruction piece. And our goal here is to eliminate the lecture. We at the Modern Classrooms Project have realized from the beginning that the lecture is the bottleneck that is causing all this inefficient style of instruction. But what's special about what we do is we actually train teachers to build their own instructional videos. Most organizations usually have kind of content already crafted if they're using the blended world. Um, and they provide that content to teachers and the teachers implement. But what we saw was a true desire from the teacher end to actually build their own instructional videos, to be the voice behind the screen. And students wanted to hear their own teacher. They wanted to know that the person in front of them was also the expert. So we train teachers to build their own instructional videos, which parlays an environment where they're no longer lecturing and they can cultivate a self-paced structure. Under the umbrella of self-paced learning, we actually only self-pace within each unit of study, which means students can truly only self-pace for five, seven, 10 lessons at a time, two weeks at a time, three weeks at a time. The reason we do this is twofold. First, we wanna create a space where all the kids are still able to collaborate and they have the opportunity for fresh starts. So if they're struggling on a unit and they struggle with the amount of self-direction, they know that they're gonna get a fresh start in the next unit and be able to improve and reflect. The second piece is we want teachers to be able to implement this model in any district or school. So this allows teachers to implement our model with the existing district pacing guidelines, tests, calendars, all that good stuff. Our model merges quite nicely with that. Lastly, mastery-based grading. We want to get to a point where students are actually traveling to the next lesson when they've mastered the previous one instead of just traveling to the next lesson because of the day of the week. And what's different about our work is that we are curriculum agnostic. So we don't care what curriculum our teachers bring to us. We teach them how to use that curriculum and manipulate that curriculum to be mastery-based grading designed. And that's really, again, so we maintain a lot of flexibility and can go anywhere to any school, to any classroom. And if you really wanna understand how our instructional model works, the best way to understand it is to watch our Edutopia video. They picked up our model after we won a few awards for the instructional model, and then the video went viral. It has about two and a half million views. It's about five minutes and really just beautifully articulates how this model works in the classroom with two teachers, myself, and soon to be the head of teaching and learning at the Modern Classrooms Project. So I wanna talk briefly now about the impacts. How do we actually think about impact over time? So on the student end, there's a few things. First is 21st century skills. You know, more important than content is actually creating a world where students are self-directed learners, they're self-aware, and they can translate those skills to novel circumstances. When you teach traditionally, you're not really modeling how the real world works. You're standing in front of a student, you're kind of spoon feeding them content, and then they're regurgitating that information. But we want to turn classrooms into environments where students are actually the drivers of their own learning. 
The next piece is differentiation. I've said for years that differentiation is the most overused and under-executed term in education. We wanna create a space where when a student walks into class, they're actually appropriately a challenge. They're not given content that's too slow or too fast for them. And then lastly, authentic mastery. Where I taught in DC, we had a 1% proficiency rate in Algebra 1, and we had a 90% graduation rate. And that delivers a dangerous message to students. It tells students that actually you don't need to learn to move forward. You just need to jump through a series of hoops and you're, you're gonna graduate. And we wanna change that narrative. We want kids leaving high school with the knowledge that they actually have to master content and understand content to be successful. On the teacher end, I graduated with a finance degree. I thought I was gonna be an investment banker. And I went to a math classroom thinking I was gonna be data driven. And the first three years that I taught in a traditional model, I didn't use data ever because I was just teaching. Kids would not do well and I would just move on to the next lesson the next day. In our classrooms, every single action a teacher makes is data driven. They're having small group instruction or individualized instruction based off of live measures of mastery and they're not stuck delivering a lecture at the front of the room. And the last piece for teachers is sustainability. We wanna create a space where teachers actually feel like their job's sustainable. When I was a teacher and I considered myself a pretty energetic teacher, it's exhausted every single day, delivering five, six, seven lectures a day, managing behavior issues, flustered because I know mastery wasn't being cultivated. We found that our model actually creates a space where teachers feel like they're able to manage behavior more effectively and they're not exhausted by putting on a performance for every single lesson. Now, we, the way we measure these impacts is through our partnership with Johns Hopkins School of Education Reform. And Dr. Rebecca Wolf is the professor that co kind of does all of our research. And what we do is we give a series of surveys to students at the beginning, middle, and end of year. Same thing with the teachers as well as a control cohort. We are also going to be collecting test scores and attendance data, but this year has obviously, obviously created a challenge for that. But they are our research partner throughout this journey. And I wanna talk a little bit about the impacts we've already seen with students. And everything we show you here is all statistically significant gains. And this right here is just a sample of some of the reports that we've seen on statistically significant impacts on kids being able to really feel a greater sense of self-efficacy and self-regulation. And also more importantly, they feel more cared for and supported in the classroom. So in this top row, you see some of that self-efficacy and self-regulation data, kids being able to learn using technology, they're able to catch up if they've missed class, they're able to take responsibility for their own learning, and they're able to learn at their own pace. Then really interestingly, they also feel like they're able to reflect more, that their teacher cares about them as an individual, that their teacher supports them and gives them encouragement and they manage the class effectively. Really exciting just initial indicators that students in our classrooms really find the learning experience more conducive and helpful for them to being successful. Now where we see some really massive gains is on the teacher end. And you can see larger reports and I'm happy to send them over if, if, if you wanna see kind of more data on this. But this is a control study done on our teachers. And it's 20 modern classrooms educators at, one of our, at three of our primary partner schools here in the DC area compared to 30 traditional educators. And this is all statistically significant at a p-value of less than 1%. This is just the sampling to spotlight some of the data. And it starts to foreshadow why so much demand has come our way since COVID-19 has broke. The first data point is I can easily help students catch up. And naturally, this is a huge concern for folks across the board here. And what we've seen is 13% of control teachers feel like they can easily help students catch up and 100% of our teachers could. Then you have the ability to use data to support students, 50% of control teacher, teachers versus 95% of our teachers. They're feeling, feeling able to effectively serve all learning levels in the classroom, 40, 30% of controls and 90% of our teachers. And then actually finding the class time stressful, kind of a reverse question here. Over a quarter of teachers were saying that they find the class time stressful in just 10% of ours. So really interesting initial indicators of how impactful our model is on the teacher, which is truly our most important customer right now. We're trying to create a space where educators feel like they can differentiate to their learners more effectively and actually create a more sustainable environment for them moving forward. So that's all the theory. That's all the content on what our model actually is. I wanna talk now about our programs. And this is when we're kind of gonna talk a little bit about our impacts during COVID-19. So initially when we started, we thought, let's start with a fellowship. So we created a fellowship here in the DC area. We ran it yearly. Our pilot year was in school year 18, 19. We started with eight teachers and I was still in the classroom at the time. And at that time, what we provided was a really intensive summer training program. We provided stipends to each teacher, $2,000 over the course of the year to really reward them for their hard work and provide them with the supports they needed. We gave them a tech package, an iPad, an Apple Pencil to create a space for them to build their own instructional videos with ease and have alignment around the technology they were using. And then we also provided year-round coaching and support, us going into the classrooms, watching their classrooms, providing feedback on implementation. We then this past summer added 25 more 
teaching fellows, so 33 total implementers in the DC area through our fellowship. And we have 50 accepted fellows starting this summer, and we are not remotely concerned about running it virtually. You'll see in a moment, we have a strong virtual model uh, set up already. And this initially was the endpoint of our work, but we found very quickly that this is now a through point for our work. Um, and we're really excited about this. And this is the philanthropy funded fellowship that is where we're generating a lot of the data and it's sort of the cream of the crop educators that we're supporting and it's done on an application basis. The next phase, and this is where you're gonna see some really big spikes in demand. Um, I believe when they initially sent out the newsletter for this webinar, we had a total of 3000 users. You'll see that that's jumped up a lot. So as of March 1st, we had already built an online course. And the purpose of the online course was to create a space for educators across the country and the world to learn our model for free. We didn't wanna hide our content. We saw that people were interested in it, so we had created it. And after nine months, we had a total of 513 users. As of this morning, we have 5,159 free users across 50 states and 81 countries, and it's growing very fast. Between 50 and 100 educators a minimum a day join our course to learn from across the world. And we've added special distance learning guidance with throughout the course to ensure that we're really providing guidance to these educators on how they can modify parts of our model to execute in the remote space, which really hasn't been challenging at all. And naturally we saw that there was a huge spike in folks actually wanting more support. They wanted training, they wanted coaching, they wanted an environment where they could get that hands-on support to get them to learn our model. So we created just eight weeks ago, a virtual mentorship program. That's a paid and enhanced version of our online course designed to support these educators, these school districts and these school leaders who want to provide their teachers with significantly more support throughout the process. And through this virtual mentorship program in just eight weeks, we've signed all these contracts. We've actually pretty much reached capacity at this point. We did not expect this much demand to come in this fast. And these are all the contracts we've already signed across the country. And what's really interesting about the contracts is they span such a diversity of partners. So you have schools like EF Academy and Trinity Episcopal High School that are private schools uh, that really were first movers in this and wanted to create a better distance learning environment and then use the model once the in-person setting returned. You have rural and suburban districts like Bellwood Antis, Frontier Central, and Shawnee Heights. You have your large urban district like DC public schools, your charter schools like Thurgood Marshall. And then you have your high ELL populations like Monte Vista School District in Colorado. Really big diversity and it just kind of shows that the demand for our model spans all these types of school environments. Now, I'm gonna talk specifically about our response to COVID. I think I foreshadowed parts of it with that virtual mentorship program and that free online course, but I wanna speak specifically to why our model is positioned to handle the challenges of COVID-19. So the first challenge is schools might close again. And we have a very simple solution to that, which is that our model actually functions in the in-person and remote setting quite beautifully. And we found this out very early because our fellows made the transition to remote learning incredibly well. In fact, one of our fellows wrote a piece for Next Generation Learning Challenges called the Pandemic Proof Approach to Teaching. She actually found that the class environment was easier to facilitate online because everything was built already. And the truth of the matter is one of the big stressors for school leaders and district leaders is how can we create a space for teachers to innovate that isn't just going to be innovating for innovation's sake or just to solve COVID-19? How can create, we create an environment where educators are learning skills, tools, and instructional models that survive and actually improve education in the in-person setting as well? And we have that exact model that can go back and forth with ease. The second phase is that students are losing valuable learning time. And this is going to be a really big challenge. We might see triple summer slides and just really big issues related to this where kids are falling off grade level. And what we have found is we have an instructional model that our teachers say and that we say does a really good job of creating a space where students can actually have time to catch up. And that's such a huge and pressing issue. And lastly, and frankly, what I, we found is the biggest stressor for school leaders is their teachers have different levels of comfort with tech-based instruction. You have incredible educators out there who have never really used technology effectively and now have to face that reality. And what we've crafted is a mastery-based, personalized professional development program where each individual educator operates in their own classroom with their own mentor to get the support that they need. So it isn't sort of blanket kind of PD provided to teachers in mass that rarely hits the right mark. And that's designed to also model our classroom. So where we fit in in the larger distance learning equation, we see there's kind of three ingredients that cultivate an effective distance learning environment. The first is technology for students and families. We don't provide that. And we've seen so many philanthropists just immediately address this need very fast. It's been extremely exciting to see. The second phase is policies and expectations for teachers, students, and families. And we can support with this, as you saw from that map, we really have a good feel for what distance learning looks like in a lot of different places and what has and has not worked. But our bread and butter 
as training and support for educators. And we're so uniquely positioned for this because from the beginning, we believe in the building of your own instructional videos. And that has now been such a hot topic for folks because teachers are away from their students. They want to be able to deliver content, but they don't want it to be an online program that isn't them. They want that connection. They want kids to hear from them. They want them to see that they're actually there and invested in everything that they do. The second piece is that we help teachers build student-friendly websites and instructional content. That's all part of that blended learning package. And we create self-paced learning experiences for students, which is so critical in an asynchronous learning environment, in a distance learning environment, where you just can't be around your kids in a classroom micromanaging every single component. So that's our bread and butter, that's where we come in. Now, what does our mentorship program actually look like? So when schools and districts or individual teachers enroll into our mentorship program, a paid experience, it usually comes at the district level or the school level, enrolling teachers in mass, and they join the mentorship program and they immediately get paired with one of our mentors. And our mentors are paid part-time mentors, much like tutors, but there are all-star implementers from our fellowship. Our best implementers that I've seen implement the model in person time and time again, who are now the leaders of this organization and the folks that are pushing forward and training educators across the country and the world. And the course itself is a self-directed journey. All the content is in there. I've built videos for every single component. So you can actually learn all the material directly in that course itself. And then we have a series of assignments. And these teachers are submitting assignments and they're getting feedback directly from their mentor within 48 to 72 hours. In addition to that, throughout the course, they can just click a simple button and request one-on-one -on -one coaching from their mentor. Their mentor gets the update, they go ahead and schedule a Zoom call. And just like this, they tackle any challenges they might have. They might be running into Roblox building videos, they might be struggling updating their Google Classroom, they might just wanna talk about how you effectively run a self-paced classroom. Our mentors are there and they're there to create that support system for educators in a personalized way. And lastly, we're approved to provide CEUs, which is just a really valuable you know, resource for schools and districts, especially for teachers looking to recertify in this sort of distance learning environment. By the end of this full journey, uh, each educator will have a full unit completed. And that unit is ready to be implemented in the in-person setting or the distance learning setting. The idea here being we want it to be mastery-based. We want proof that each educator can build a full unit that's ready to go. And at that point, they can then take those skills and continue to build the rest of their units for their classes. Now, like I mentioned earlier, initially when we created this organization, this was the end point of our work. We had a fellowship, we wanted to run a series of fellowships throughout the country, and that's how we'd scale. But we've now realized that our fellowship is actually a through point to a far more innovative way to achieve impact and achieve a far greater impact. So our fellowship program is where educators learn the model in a very high touch support structure, and it's where we're cultivating the cream of the crop. And currently we have 33 folks who've already been trained and execute this model beautifully, and we are adding 50 more this summer. Now, a subset of these folks are going to be paid virtual mentors. And of the 33 that we have now, we have 14 virtually virtual mentors that are currently getting paid, which is around 40% of the cohort. We hope to maintain a number just like that. So over time, the more fellows we have, we can generate that 40% through point. And we're currently estimating each mentor can train about 30 teachers a year on the implementation of the model. We kept it on a fairly reasonable estimate. We're gonna find out a ton this summer through all these partnerships about how much time it actually takes for each mentee to go through the course, how much capacity each mentor will have. But in just school year 2021, this will allow us to get 420 teachers trained through our virtual mentorship program. Now, this right here tells a story about scale over time. So how we're actually going to achieve that scale and how we're going to build capacity within the organization. So this top row here is those virtual mentors, those cream of the crop educators that are training other teachers. And you'll see here, this next row is our number of new fellows. So this is the 40 that we're gonna be training this summer. We wanna see another 40% get pipelined directly through, our, through to our mentorship. And as we grow our fellowship, we continue to push more and more mentors to join our team to continue to support educators. This row right here, we're assuming 30 teachers per mentor. And that's how we're generating the number of teachers that we support through our virtual mentorship. We also expect that we have about a 75% retention rate of educators. So this is just returning educators that are modern classrooms teachers. And you add all three of these numbers up and that's where you get your total modern classrooms teachers year on year. And we assume that each teacher teaches around 80 students. We have some elementary teachers who obviously teach less more in the 25 to 30 zone. And then you have high school teachers teaching 120, 140 students. So we average it to about 80 students per teacher. And that's how you get the student impact numbers. Now, this is our base case approach to scale. However, we do know that there's a potential opportunity for us to scale much faster. And we are currently testing that. 
So if we wanted to scale significantly faster, we'd be able to draw a line from people we train virtually to becoming virtual mentors. Instead of just pipelining our fellows, we can actually take the folks in these partnerships that we're doing throughout districts, and we actually turn the best teachers that we train virtually into mentors as well. And if you just, ass just assume, just assume, just assume, set up virtually can then become virtual mentors, you see a far faster approach to scale, where we're actually reaching 12,000 teachers by school year 2023, we're reaching 214,000 educators in five years and over 17 million students. This is an exciting approach. We already have one teacher that we're testing this on. We took this teacher, we trained them virtually, and now we've created them, we've made them into a virtual mentor to see how successful they are at executing this. And that right there covers the full presentation. I'm incredibly excited to answer any questions folks have. Um, and with that, I will move to you, Pat. Great. Thank you so much, Kareem. Uh, obviously, you threw a lot at us there, uh, both from just the suite of offerings of the Mon Mo Modern Classrooms platform, uh, ability to scale, as well as how you've recalibrated during COVID-19. Um, and so I, I see a few questions have already come in. Uh, obviously, I encourage folks to keep typing those in uh, using that Q&A feature, and we'll be able to get to those uh, following Amy. Uh, who I'm going to turn it over to now uh, to talk a little bit about both future schools, uh, you know, as an organizational overview and then their partnership with Modern Classrooms. So with that, uh, Amy, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be here. Thanks for having me, Pat, and um, Philanthropy Roundtable. Great overview, Kareem. Every time I listen to your presentation, I think this is the fourth time, it, I learned something new and the statistics and information gets updated so quickly that even though I heard it two weeks ago, you're doing amazing work and we're really proud to support you. So I'm Amy Valentine and I run a national nonprofit called Future of School. You may be asking yourself if we're new and if we were born amidst the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and no, we are not new. We've actually been around for for several years. Um, as Pat said in my intro, we're formerly known as um, the Foundation for Blended and Online Learning. We've been around, this is our fifth year of grant making. We're just about to enter into that fifth year. And so we changed our name and our brand in the fall, obviously not knowing anything about COVID-19 or the pandemic. We changed our name because our call to action got bigger. As an organization, the, the Foundation for Blended and Online Learning emerged to be able to increase access that students and teachers have to technology, to innovation, and to personalized learning pathways in schools across America. So like Kareem, we're agnostic. We don't endorse any curriculum, any platform provider. We don't endorse any school type. Our board came together under the leadership of Dr. Rod Page, former Secretary of Education, with a call to action to bring our schools into the future now. So we changed our name in the fall, again, um, you know, not, not knowing what was gonna happen, but knowing that we wanted to reach more parents, more teachers, and more students. So how do we do this? We have three, up until COVID-19, we had three main um, arms of our organization. The first one is a student scholarship program. We give scholarships to students who have taken a certain number of online or blended classes as part of their high school experience. And our scholarship program is really unique because we honor and recognize students that are pioneers, students that take online classes that would have otherwise not been available to them, students that enroll in emerging blended programs in their district, students who are really creative in following their passion pursuits, and that has been made possible for them by embracing some sort of tech-enabled instruction or learning. And so um, we've given 133 awards. Here's some of the faces of our winners. I love this slide because it really, as a former teacher, it's very grounding to see the faces of the students that we're giving awards to. We're helping them further their academic careers and follow their passions. Our scholarship program is not based on students who earn 4.0s who or want to attend a four-year university. Certainly we give scholarships to the profile of students, but really our scholarship is designed to broadcast the impact that um, tech-enabled learning has on students across the country in any school type, private, public, homeschool, who are going on to not only four-year universities, but to community colleges, tech and trade schools as well. So this is a map. We're about to announce our 2020 scholars 
we gather videos from them where they talk about their experiences, they talk about their journeys. And then what we do as an organization is we've been using their stories to be of influence over other people, whether it's legislators or school leaders or people who say, um, you know, I can't imagine how this would benefit students in a rural area. We can show them the videos. We can put the student voice forward. Um, we just started receiving our videos from our winners from 2020, and I've watched two, and I will tell you, both of them bring tears to my eyes because of their ability to articulate that had it not been for their opportunity to take blended online classes, that they're not sure where they would have ended up. They probably would have graduated, but they wouldn't have graduated with as much specific focus to follow their pathway that they did. One of the great benefits of our scholarship program is we can we survey our students. So we send surveys out to them multiple times a year. Uh, we sent one to the 2016 to 2019 cohort that asked them about their impressions of if and how coronavirus has changed people's perceptions of online and blended learning. And we received oh, just over a 70% response rate from our kids. And they gave us wonderful feedback when we asked them, what would you tell students? What would you tell policymakers? What, what would you tell a school leader about integrating blended and online learning? And they give really amazing feedback because these are kids who have experienced it. The second program that we have is giving funding to teachers. We give teacher grants to educators that have a blended learning pilot that they want to integrate into their classroom. So up until COVID-19, this was, it was, you know, the minority of teachers. They would find us, they would say, hey, I know if I have this technology, it could fund this program and it could take my classroom to the next level. I could differentiate instruction, like Kareem said, often underused and underutilized, but oh my gosh, if I had this technology, I could do that. And we storytell on behalf of those educators as well. Uh, we've given over 30 awards to students in 18 states. And each year, this might make you scratch your heads and it definitely makes us as an organization, we haven't received enough quality proposals to give away the money that we have. And the challenge there is we're, we're growing as an organization and also teachers historically haven't been, you know, reaching out as much as they are now, looking for resources to innovate in their classrooms. So this is actually how I met Kareem, which I'll go over in just a minute. Our third program is impact reports. We publish impact reports about the efficacy and the impact of blended and online learning for teachers, students, and for schools as a whole. We really want to represent the voice of students and teachers. As an organization, we know that it's critically important that we hear from students and teachers about how they teach best and how they learn best. And that's something that at every conference we're at where we have students and teachers, it, it is the biggest draw to hear from those experiences, to hear from those individuals. So post COVID-19, um, we've had, you know, we've been very, very busy um, continuing with our traditional programs and then also adapting. We have access to a lot of information through our network around what the future holds and how we can bring our schools to reimagine, like Secretary DeVos said at previous webinars and in her statements that it's time to reimagine what K-12 education looks like in our country. And we're, that brings us excitement. We're excited about that because we've, been, we've had proof of concept for many, many years across the country. So we're excited to be able to help lead those discussions and be a convener to bring people together. So putting up some critical statistics, these are some of the things that we talk about as an organization and our board around, we have a lot of moving parts. So what can we do to ensure that schools have what they need and that they're empowered to make those changes. So my second to last slide. Um, so we have our traditional grant making programs and we're also stepping out into some different areas that we could have immediate impact. And all of this can be found on our website. And this is how I met Kareem. We met through the Remote Learning Relief Fund. Very quickly after COVID-19 hit, we took our teacher grant fund, some of those funds, and turn them into immediately available funds for schools, teachers, and nonprofits that were doing incredible, amazing work that we knew could be scalable to a larger degree to help provide more infrastructure. So we, um, our largest grant actually went to, the, to Kareem and to his team to be able to help support their virtual training program. And we're working with him. We still have the, his initiative listed on our website to be able to bring in funds 
And so um, we were quickly able to pivot to respond and also to help educate a larger community about the future of education in our country and then also important work that's being done to get there. So I encourage you to join us. You can visit our website. It's futureof.school, not .com. We kind of put a stake in that territory there. We have our hashtag future of school and you're welcome to email me, call me, um, text me. We're really eager to, to bring people together to continue this important work that we're doing because we know the future of school will never look the same, but it's exciting and there's a lot of opportunity that comes with that. Great, thank you so much, Amy, for that overview. Uh, let's dive right into the, the questions. Um, the first batch, admittedly, uh, are sort of geared towards modern questions. I see a couple uh, geared towards online learning and, and future school that Amy, I'm sure you'll be able to field uh, in a little bit. But with that said, the first question that came in uh, relates to uh, the accessibility of modern classrooms to students and teachers uh, with disabilities, both uh, those who maybe are blind or are hard of hearing. Uh, Kareem, how do you, can you answer that question about accessibility and whether or not you also help students uh, also with uh, executive function disorders? Yeah, fantastic question. So, I mean, one of the beauties of our model is it creates a space where teachers have more time to work with students individually. So the true benefit of creating a modern classroom is it allows the teacher to not spend their time at the front of the room sort of mass lecturing and instead personalizing to students needs. So the true benefit doesn't come in with the idea that, you know, a kid has to watch an instructional video, but instead the fact that a teacher can then actually target those students with special needs who might be hard of hearing, might have executive functioning and provide more hands on one on one support. And that kind of comes through with that data point where students feel more supported in the classroom. So we're constantly trying to innovate. We found that this is an extremely useful model for students with special needs, and especially students with English language learners. Um, but in particular, the way we support kind of students with unique needs is we create a space where the teacher can actually just spend more time with them. In the distance learning space, this is obviously an incredibly large challenge, right? Um, especially, you know, students that are blind or are hard of hearing. Um, but overall, that's the true design, right, is, is being able to make teachers more available for students. Got it. And just as a follow-up, um, can you just share more in information on student demographics in terms of, you obviously explained uh, the scale of, of your impact on students. Can you go into a little bit about uh, the makeup of, of, of those students who have been uh, maybe impacted by the teachers uh, accessing modern classrooms? Absolutely. So in our fellowship, anything that's philanthropy funded, we are only working with students at over 50% free and reduced lunch and largely very low income schools. With our partnerships where districts are actually paying us or schools are actually paying us full cost for our work, we support really any customer there is. Now we wanted to test this out in environments like private schools, but the large bulk of our partners are schools that serve a high diversity of learning levels. This doesn't necessarily mean that it's a high minority population or that the economic, uh, you know, impact like the school is, is serving 75 or 80 percent free and reduced lunch what it means is when a teacher walks into the classroom they are teaching students that span multiple grade levels and ability level so all the philanthropy funded fellowship work directly supporting very low income schools high need environments our partnership work we target partners that tend to have a high diversity of learning levels but we're also wanting to test this model in a variety of places including private schools and, and you know suburban kind of middle income districts Got it. Um, and then just in terms of a um, pretty basic question, what is the difference between modern classrooms and Khan Academy? And then yeah, also, absolutely. Amy, I'll, I'll let you feel that one as well, uh, just in terms of future of school, in terms of the distance learning uh, programs and platforms that you, you guys promote as well. Absolutely. I mean, really, the only, there's only a couple things that are actually similar between Khan Academy and Modern Classrooms Project. So first, one of the most important components of our models is that the teachers are the content creators. Right, so Khan Academy comes packaged with all the content. You kind of just open up a computer and it's an online learning experience. It isn't integrated with the, the school-wide principles and it isn't integrated with sort of collaborative activities. It's largely just student learns on a screen and masters skills. In our model, the teachers are the content creators. They're at the center of the experience. We've known for years that the teachers are the most important factor of student learning. So I actually, as an educator, struggled with this because when I first started teaching, I tried using things like Khan Academy and Alex, different programs in the classroom, but I felt like I was slowly losing touch with my students and being replaced, which is problematic when the teacher is the most important factor in student learning. The second piece is the customization. So when you're given a program like Khan Academy, there's really not much you can customize. They've built good content in-house. 
that is implementable. But what we found and what we know about schools and districts is they're run locally. They all have unique characteristics that pertain to their environment. And every student is different in those classrooms. And Khan Academy isn't designed to support that. And the last and frankly, what I would say is the biggest challenge that folks face is a Khan Academy video for a 10th grade math class is built for a student who is currently at a 10th grade math level. But what do you do when you give a Khan Academy video for a student that's actually on a seventh grade math level sitting in a 10th grade math class? The truth of the matter is it goes in one ear and out the other. So when you kind of provide outsourced content that's on grade level, that actually isn't supportive to students that are off grade level. And in low income schools, that's the large majority of students. So at, at the end, the core difference is that we are empowering teachers to be at the center of the learning experience and to drive this work. Got it. Uh, Amy, did you have anything to add? I did, and this will address one of the one or two of the questions in the q and I'm going to link it together. Um, you know, I think there's a question around parents feeling like the, the, the online learning and online instruction has been an abysmal failure um, since COVID-19 or due to COVID-19. And one of the things we're working on as an organization is clarifying some of the terminology. Because we say at Future of School, what, what occurred in March and April was crisis schooling or emergency, emergency schooling. Online education and blended learning, those are fields that have been around for the last 25 years. The first online school was opened in California in 1994, and it was opened by a district to be able to support a different pathway for students. And so, um, you know, we're redefining and redefining these terms because it's really important for people within the space that have been running district-based online programs or online-based companies that have an, you know, a tool that can be integrated, that with that comes training. With that comes uh, accreditation. Online schools have to operate, if they're public schools or programs of the district, they have to follow all of the state requirements and all of the state laws and policies, in particular around special education. So any service you're required to provide in your local brick and mortar school, in an online school, we're talking the schools that have existed, they have to adhere to all of those guidelines. And if they don't, then those schools don't exist, they cease to exist. And so, um, there has been a lot of confusion around that. So what we say at Future of School is COVID-19 caused crisis schooling, and that was whatever it takes. That's delivering meals to homes to kids. It's filling in for SEL. It's dropping packets off at homes. It's getting kids online through emergency broadband access through cell phone companies. And I give leaders a lot of credit for the amazing work they did to do that, to, to respond so quickly to the demands. Um, the next phase of that is remote learning and that's learning anywhere there's an intentionality with that but that the online education is a field that's been around for a long time i and i understand the confusion right it's new to most people so going back to your original question at, at future of school we're creating some um, we're creating a, some standards within our organization for some of the nonprofit for nonprofits and for for profits around how long they've been around what service they provide. We're not gonna give them necessarily a rating. We're not gonna turn in, you know, turn into that type of organization. But we do have to have some kinds of standards when we do either recommend or support an organization. So we're in the process of doing that now. So there'll be more to follow on that. But it's important that, you know, with over 5,000 ed tech tools at market right now, it is overwhelming for leaders when they're going into the fall thinking, what do I use? How do I use it? How do I tell the difference? And so we really want to provide some support in that area and we're working on that right now. Great. Uh, thanks for that, Amy. And Corinne, to kind of redirect it uh, back to you, uh, Amy addressed some of the uh, criticisms that online learning tends to get and misconceptions. Uh, piggybacking on that, you know, you ob Modern Classrooms obviously has district partnerships. Um, what's been the response from teacher unions? Uh, have you been met with, you know, given that they tend to bristle sometimes at uh, certain online providers, uh, et cetera, uh, what can you share any insight as to how unions may uh, may have responded to modern classrooms? We've only been embraced by unions, and the reason why is we're a teacher professional development organization, and we're responding live to a need. So we don't see us as an organization that comes in and replaces or mandates or provides any proprietary technology or anything like that. We actually come in and say, hey, teachers, you actually have the resources, the applications in your school building. Let's teach you how to do that, and let's do that in an effective way. 
We also just get really positive ratings on the quality of our professional development and that it's personalized. So unions actually view us as an ally because they see us as an opportunity to help support teachers, which is great because we also want to, you know, we, we don't want to come in and create any environment other than one that allows educators to feel like they're in a more supportive and productive environment for them to grow and be able to think in a forward thinking way. So we haven't really received any pushback on the union end. We also haven't received any pushback from the district leadership end. Um, and the interesting thing about the bulk of our partnerships largely because of our capacity is we're also training sort of the cream of the crop educators in each of these districts. These are opt-in folks. These are folks that saying, I wanna learn this so I can share it with my colleagues. I wanna be the leaders of this district so I can then disseminate this information to others. So it's a much, very, very much so an opt-in model. And also there's so much demand for our style of work right now, as you can see with the sort of 5,000 free users, that there hasn't been any pushback yet. We're obviously prepared to handle that and we'll certainly address it as it comes, but it's certainly, we, we seem to be currently just a support organization that people are appreciative of. Got it. Um, and then the next question uh, gets at uh, instruction at the K through one level. Um, how have you, uh, how do you cater, how does Modern Classrooms cater to that, if at all? Uh, and then Amy, I, you know, just, I want to throw that to you as well, just in terms of future schools and uh, what you've seen uh, maybe with distance learning initiatives at uh, that, that uh, secondary level of school. Fantastic. So the, you know, when we created this organization, it was created right. by two high school math teachers. Um, and two high school math teachers came in there and built the instructional model. We then scared it to a broad variety of content areas and grade levels. The bulk of our implementers are six through 12 just because self-direction is easier to kind of make happen at that early stage. However, we trained a large cohort of elementary teachers that are actually teaching in Pennsylvania now, and they implemented beautifully at the K through one level. So we do support elementary teachers. Elementary teachers actually have a far better understanding of what student-centered teaching looks like, because frankly, it's just way harder to stand in front of a room and talk at a bunch of kindergartners and first graders. The challenges with the K and one level largely revolve around the kind of distance learning space, which is A, do teachers build all this content out for all the subject areas they're, they're teaching? If I'm a first grade teacher, do I build videos for science, English, math, history, and electives? And the second piece is, who are you actually communicating with in the distance learning space? In other words, if you're a K-1 teacher, are you talking to parents to cultivate sort of a quasi homeschool environment for your kids to get through remote instruction? And if not, how are we creating access and structure so that these kids can access this content without relying on their parents? So we do have a cohort and we certainly support elementary teachers. I would say 70%, 75% of the teachers we're, we're supporting through the mentorship program is six through 12. And it's just fundamentally more challenging to execute remote instruction and distance learning the younger the kids get. Um, because of the, the need for self-direction. In the in-person setting, we support elementary very comfortably. It's actually just in the distance learning setting where there's unique challenges. Got it. Um, and then Amy. Yeah, I would, I would add to that, that, you know, the, the elementary school levels with, re, with crisis schooling and remote instruction, it, it is very challenging, more challenging than as the, as the students get older. Um, and I would encourage people to look at state run, you know, nonprofits to the to the organizations that have been running full time online schools programs of the district, because they've been offering uh, elementary online education for many, many years. Now, if you ask me what the proportion of middle school and high school versus elementary, you know, just anecdotally, it's higher. There's more kids that are older because older kids, they can take two courses. It might be part of their school offering. Um, but there have been full-time online elementary schools happening in our country for the most of the last 20 years. It does require an involved adult, and that adult takes the role of learning coach or mentor. And we know that good instructional practices as the student gets older, they spend more time online because you build those capabilities. And when they're younger, approximately 20% of their time is spent offline with manipulatives and books and tools. So it really is more of a blended learning model at home versus as kids get older, it's more of the online. Um, but it is possible, and, it, and a lot of it has to do with the curriculum, too. There is adaptive, adaptable curriculum that's online that's been designed by experts that are part of online schools that I think brick-and-mortar schools are now looking at saying, okay, how can we either equip our teachers to create something like this, or how can we use resources like this? Um, it's just a matter of the level of empowerment and the mindset within the school leader. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot of teachers excited to want to do that, excited to want to hone in on their skills through, you know, offerings like Kareem's moving forward. 
And Amy, that's a great segue into the next question uh, for, for Kareem of, of how, how important is principal buy-in uh, in this work? Uh, and then, you know, uh, and then on that, just talking about the piggy, the ripple effect, essentially, of a teacher using the modern classrooms platform uh, within within a, a school in a brick and mortar setting, but now obviously virtually. Yeah. So a couple of things here. I mean, you know, historically pre COVID-19, we would say that principal buy-in is important because you want to cultivate an environment where teachers are free to innovate. Right. The big concern is when a teacher is put in a position where they need to innovate, they need to know that they have the conditions to potentially make mistakes and to fail. In the kind of COVID-19 era, I think principal support looks like actually providing funding, right? It's, it's whether or not a principal and a leader is willing to kind of create the space and invest dollars into teacher professional development. Regardless, principal buy-in is generally important. We need principals to understand that teachers need to change the way instruction works moving forward. And I think what's been really cool to see nationally is teachers are, is principals and leaders are making this shift as we speak. They recognize the need to make this shift. They're prepared for it. And folks uh, that I'm literally communicating with and signing partnerships are saying, you know, ask me six months ago and I would have said I like sort of a traditional clear approach to teaching, but now we realize that we need to innovate and we need to innovate fast. So more than anything, you need the space for innovation. So you need principals to say, yes, go for it, push yourself. And we kind of take it from there. Um, and then in an ideal world, you have principals that are actually pushing it forward and creating a space for it to then get shared. With regards to building capacity, one thing that we innovated and created is we knew capacity on our end, both because of a funding and just the number of virtual mentors we had, was limited, so we built what we called professional learning community resources. So this creates a space where if you're a school district and you bring your 20 best teachers and you enroll them into the Modern Classrooms Virtual Mentorship Program, they actually leave with a professional learning community resources. So they can actually run meetings through our free course and share this with all their other teachers, both at the beginning of the, at the end of the summer to prepare them for the school year and then throughout the school year. So one of the things we wanted to do was create a space where if we couldn't train all your teachers in a district, we train the best ones and the, the representatives from all the key content areas. For example, in DC public schools, we're training representatives from each content area. And their job is then to then share that content out with others and we provide the supports to execute that. Great. Um, and then a ne next question on uh, relates to higher ed and whether or not modern classrooms is being adopted by universities uh, for degree programs. Kareem, I know it is, so I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you feel that. But uh, and then Amy, um, and, and then Amy, the same for you. Just in terms of future schools work, in terms bridging the gap between uh, distance learning and and the initiatives that future school promotes and uh, higher ed. Yeah, you know, it's never been our target, right? We didn't come into this industry saying we're going to revolutionize the higher ed world, our bread and butter was working on K-12 schools, in particularly low-income environments. So in the, the degree with which higher ed is using it is actually just organic growth. We have tons of professors and just folks that are teachers at community colleges and higher ed just joining our free course and participating in the program. Number of the universities that we're actually reaching out to, uh, representatives from, from Navy, uh, Ball State University, Grinnell College, these are folks that have just reached out to us and said, hey, we want to teach our professors this, can they learn this model? Um, we are delicate about overusing our resources. We're young, we are still you know, fundraising, so we don't wanna to direct too much of our attention away from K-12 schooling, which is our bread and butter and where we see our biggest impact. So all of the action that's happening in higher ed is happening organically. I have no doubt this model would work quite effectively at high ed. Um, I certainly wish my classrooms were run this way if I was back in college. Um, so all the growth that's happening there is all organic. Great, and just to piggyback off of that, we too are a young organization and we're a growing organization. So we, I mean, we definitely have aspirations to work more directly in the higher ed space and also with workforce readiness because we know that, um, you know, there's been lots of discussions and articles and research done around the skills that, that, that this generation needs to have to meet the needs and demands of the workforce and that there's been some discrepancies there. And what we also know is that from our scholarship winners, that when, when, a, when a student is empowered to take the classes they're interested in, to follow their passion pursuits, and to really have a customized, differentiated high school experience, and prior to that, as middle school and elementary as well, that they're able to identify what they want to do with more accuracy, and they're able to create that plan sooner. So we our work in higher ed has been really around staying in touch with our students and, and just asking them, how did your experiences in high school or in the K-12, you know, your K-12 education, how did that impact you now looking back? And their feedback to us is incredible. It's you know, having exposure to the platform that I was enrolled in 
It allowed me, you know, a, a shorter learning curve. And I can tell the students who weren't exposed to technology when they were in high school because they, they struggle in that first semester, which now is different, right, with COVID-19. Now it's a kind of a different, um, different space that we're in. But we would love to form partnerships and to work in, in that way both with higher ed and with the workforce, because again, we, we have the proof of concept of how it works when it's implemented, not even perfectly, when it's implemented well, or when it's implemented with intention in a school or a district. And when you see that, it, it, it's life-changing for your perceptions of education. Definitely. Um, and then, so we have, we're, we're coming up on three o'clock. We have time for maybe one more question and, and for you uh, both to maybe have a, a final word on, on just uh, takeaways for donors on this call. Um, and with that said, there was a comment that came through uh, related to just the fatigue and lack of capacity associated with during the COVID pandemic on the part of teachers as well as parents uh, in their ability to really administer quality education. Um, can you both maybe dis just talk about that um, that aspect of in terms of how modern classrooms uh, has you know um, uh, is responsive to maybe parents who aren't always able to uh, be there with 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 their kids as they're going through programs and then uh, as well as just the capacity of teachers uh, in, in their ability to administer quality education um, and then uh, from there uh, I'll uh, any and and just any other general thoughts final comments on uh, the donor role in, in, in your work. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, fatigue is an incredibly important issue to kind of think about right now. From the fatigue on the parent end, you know, what we say is part of the fatigue comes with confusion. If I come home and my students distance learning structure is hard to follow, isn't clear and concise, there aren't clear instructional videos available, it's hard to kind of manage from one step to the next, I'm going to get fatigued far quicker. So one of the things that we do is, is actually teach teachers how to run a effective digital learning space so that parents aren't confused and kids aren't confused and that doesn't spike their stress levels. So from a parent end, you know, we just help create a space by supporting these teachers so that accessing content and traveling from one lesson to the next is quite easy. And we articulate how important that is to our teachers. You need to create a structure where it is very obvious how a parent goes from one lesson to the next. You need to shrink the number of platforms you use. You should not be using a bunch of different tech programs. You don't want to send a kid on one program one day and another program to the next day. It just confuses parents and overwhelms them. From the teacher end, you know, fatigue is just a reality when you're an educator. I was an educator for six years and it was an extremely exhausting profession. But part of that fatigue actually derives from how inefficient instruction is. So if I'm stuck in a classroom and constantly working against myself, getting frustrated by low test scores, aren't creating a space for me to lead actual in-person kind of small group instruction, don't know how to manage my data, feel like I'm not responding to data. These are all stressors and those stressors then lead to a spike in fatigue. So part of what we do at the Modern Classrooms Project is to articulate to teachers how if you plan efficiently and effectively and create these self-directed systems where students can travel from one lesson to the next and you have clear responsibilities as the learning facilitator, you're gonna see a decline in stress level. And that's what we've seen in the data as well. So, so much of teacher fatigue and stress is actually a consequence of instructional models that are traditional in style and inefficient in, a, in, in their effectiveness. And in turn creates a space where teachers are constantly playing catch up and trying to stay afloat. So that's how we address um, sort of, you know, fatigue on both the parent and the teacher end. And then lastly, kind of from a larger standpoint on the modern classrooms end, you know, we are a young and growing organization. We're financially stable for this year, but there's so much demand that we've actually reached a point where we have to actually put a waiting list on school and district contracts because we don't have the capacity or funding to necessarily meet all those needs. So certainly, you know, for the philanthropists out there that are interested in learning more about our work, please check out the slide deck that Pat shares. Reach out to me directly if you want to have discussions. If you're intrigued by the idea of sort of bringing the modern classrooms to your local community, just want to learn more about how we're scaling the organizational structure, how we want to get funded, and so on and so forth, um, you know, definitely reach out. We are, we are growing fast and we're trying our best to meet the demand. Thanks so much, Kareem. And just Amy, super fast, maybe just a final word uh, for, for those on the call. Sure, yeah. And Kareem took the words out of my mouth, so I only have a few words and now. Um, so everything that he said, but to parents, I would say the to look at the glass half full, right? To parents, you now have a better understanding than ever before of how your child learns. Maybe you know more now about school choice, that there's different options for your child and, and finding a good fit for them and where they go to school. And for teachers, it's I would encourage teachers to really look at the fact that 
their voice and their reputation has never been louder or more important. They are the heart of the classroom and we want to come together to use technology to make their jobs easier and to help them uh, work with more students and um, empowerment goes a really long way. And to echo what Kareem said, we're a new organization as well and we have the ability to support um, or Kareem as a new leader and other nonprofits that are doing critical, um, measurable, accountable work at a bigger, larger level. And so I would encourage you to talk to me as well. And I really want to thank Kareem for the partnership because it's been a, a great journey this spring. Thank you, Amy. It is well been said. Well said, and, uh, and thank you both for joining us today. Thank you to all those uh, who participated uh, and listened in. Uh, as, as we've all alluded to uh, throughout the call, we'll make resources available, both PowerPoint presentations, the Edutopia video that Kareem alluded to at the outset, uh, as well as just um, you know, encouraging and facilitating any follow-up uh, that folks may have uh, with both Kareem and Amy as it relates to their uh, respective organizations and their work uh, going forward. So with that said, thank you all so much for joining us and hope to see you again and hear from you soon. Thank, thank you. Thank you, hope to hear from you all.